on the Miles Road wheels and on the tank's return rollers, we have here on the rubber tire the detail for the rubber tire marks, which are from the company Continental. Continental Rubber Tire Company made the tires for German AFE and military vehicles during World War II. The word, wording detail that's on the tires is the correct font and the font and the typeface are at the proper letting and kerning. The only purposely done mistake done by DML was that they purposely spelt the name Continental wrong. If we notice, it's Continental instead of Continental. This is to avoid any litigation from the from the rubber company or whoever owns the rubber company today. To remove, to transform the U into an L, it's a simple fix and is done with a, well I used a razor blade. A sharp exacto will also work too. Now as of note, I did it uh, when the wheels were already pre-mounted to the vehicle. However, it would have been a lot easier to do it before the wheels were assembled while they were still on their runners. However, if you do have a, like the pre-built version, it's a simple fix to, to make even when the wheels are assembled. Primarily because the way the Panzer II track is, it's not as evasive as say the wheels on a Sherman where you have all the boogies and truck detailing in the way. Here's the corrected typeface here. Once the tires get painted black and have their weathering done to them, they will look a lot better. And the job will blend in much better as we have here on the one of the, the return rollers. Another addition that was made to the tank's final drive was the addition of the tank's what appear to be oil release valves. The valves themselves are just two small acorned bolts and there's, from what I've seen from my research, the, each final drive gets two of them. There's one here in the front and another one here on the top portion of the final drive. This detail is symmetrical and is found on both sides of the vehicle. While working on the tank's front, it's important to note that there's some portions here on the front transmission cover that DML admitted. These would be the tow cable locks and the tow shackles that would be mounted here on the front. For these parts, instead of scratch building them, they are currently offered on the market by six scale icons. Here go the six scale icon components here, starting with the tank's front tow cable system. It comes with the tow cable end caps. These caps here would actually be fitted to that real seal cable, thus giving you the illusion of having the cable actually wrapped around the eyelet here, and some other small fasteners. As mentioned earlier, it has a steel cable, and these here are the tow cable mounts. These mounts are all ca cast in white metal and are very durable and mount flush with the tank's transmission cover in that they're the perfect shape. There's no, they're not oblong or, or anything like that. They're very nice pieces and, have, and highly recommended if you're building a Panzer II. The tow shackles are the same story. They come unassembled. You get a bag full of fasteners and some photo etch parts along with some chain. And here goes a close up of the type of detail that you get with the, the front tow hook. Again, just like the tow cable mounts, it is a perfect circumference with the front transmission cover. And all these pieces here will assemble. Get the the front tow pivot and several lock pins. Also included are uh, some instructions and as well as if you need to look at some pictures, he has pictures of them on his website which is listed over here below. With the aid of the pictures on the website and the ones from the assembly instructions, the, these will assemble very quickly and will be mounted to the vehicle. Here go the six scale icon components fully assembled and mounted to the vehicle. As you can see, they give the vehicle a lot of detail that is missing in the original kit. The parts themselves assemble very easily and once the model is fully painted, the supply chain will be added to these locations here.
the model's front fenders have been added and have been made to be functional. The fenders themselves do come with the kit and are designed to be simply glued into two little notches that are here on, that are molded into the fender. The fender does have the hinge mounts molded in and to make the fender work was a simple affair. The bottom of the fender has these two little pins that are molded in. These two little pins are deleted. Holes are then drilled by a Dremel into the molded in hinges on both the fender and on the uh, on, on the muff flap and a small two little small wire brads are then inserted in their place once these wire brads are inserted the fenders are fully functional just like the tanks front fenders the tanks rear fenders have been made to be functional and also like the tanks front fenders the tanks rear fenders were meant to just be glued on in their place to make the fenders functional uh, the, the hinges were drilled out and a small nail was placed into the hinge of the fender as well as the mud flap. Now, similar to like that on a Panzer IV, I went ahead and added an extension spring to the mud flap and the fender. This keeps it in place and also adds a bit of detail to it. Now, the hinge itself is fully functional in that when it opens up, the spring locks the mud flap in the open position. And, and retains it there. And then just flick it down and it keeps it in the down position. From all of my research, I was not able to find the spring added to the two front fenders, so they are springless. Moving up and down the fenders, we can see that the tank's rivets have been added. On the real Panzer II, the fenders are comprised of two pieces. You had the German diamond plate for the top, and then you had a small piece of angle iron that would run along the length of the fender on the bottom. This small piece of angle iron was fastened to the diamond plate via these rivets that you see here. For the rivets themselves, I used this set here from microfasteners.com. Like I did in an earlier video, that there is the item number as well as the contact information for microfasteners. To do the entire tank, I used approximately 150 rivets to do the job. As I mentioned earlier, the fender is comprised of both the diamond plate and the angle iron. Now, because of that, you will have a small seam that runs along the entire length of the fender. Now, two ways that this could be added. One, you could go ahead and try to find a small plastic strip and glue it to the side of the fender here, which will give you the illusion of that the fender is comprised of two parts. You could also try to mask it and carefully try to engrave the seam in there. However, this might be problematic and is very, very risky to do. Another way to do it is a simple way in that I took a piece of masking tape and I masked off the bottom of this lip here. I then went ahead and took black paint and painted it on the tape. Once the tape dried, I went ahead and pulled it off and the small little portion that was not taped up, the paint stuck to. Now there's, it's hard to see in this image here, but there's a small little lip now that is between this part of the fender and the top part of the, of the deck. The small lip, once painted, will give you the illusion that the fender is comprised of two separate pieces. Starting with the jack blocks, the kit supplies you with these three mounts here for the tank's jack. The jack mounts themselves are very basic and are all solid plastic. I did was able to modify the kit supplied mounts in making a few alterations to them. First, a small little slice was added here with a small X-Acto saw. This slice here allows you to slip the jack in once painted and it also adds the proper line that should be there since these pieces are not, are not molded one piece. On the real jack block here, this here would hinge open and so the hinge is molded in, however, I went ahead and drilled out the hinge and added two small little lines with an X-Acto saw. This gives you the appearance of the hinge. The, the jack itself will be added once the model is painted. For the jack block itself, the kit does supply you with a plastic jack block.
However, the as you can see here, the block is very basic in detail and will not be used. Instead, a wooden block will be added once the model is painted. For the blocks, for the block mount itself, I went ahead and used the EastCoastArmory.com block mounting set, but instead of the the actual hinge that is used on the other sets, which are more designed for Tigers and Tiger Twos, I went ahead and fabricated the hinge mechanism all out of brass. The mechanism itself is fully functional in that if I remove the wing nut, the hinge, the piece hinge is open, allowing me to install the jack block. Once the block is installed, I could then go ahead and secure it down again. These pieces, if you notice, are actually bolted to the tank's fender, which give a nice secure fit, as well as match the tank's detail integrity. As we can see, the tank's tool clamps have been added and fabricated. The tank does supply you with the tools needed to build a model. However, I wasn't exactly very impressed with the way the clamps were molded into the tank's tools. I always like to replace the plastic handles with wooden, real wooden ones. This will be done. Some parts, like the shovel and the axe, will be recycled. I'm going to cut off the plastic handle and, and just mount the wooden handle to the tank's shovel blade. However, because of this, the clamp will not be needed. So rather than go ahead and try to modify the clamp, I went ahead and used a set of my brass ones. The brass clamps are fully functional and are soldered together as well as they're mounted and fixed permanently to the tank's deck via fasteners. Also as of note, to because I was replacing the tank's tool mounting system, the tank does have several holes that are molded into the deck for you to plug the tools in. To delete these, I had to first put some masking tape on the bottom of the fender, and when I had some resin, I went ahead and poured some liquid resin into these holes. Once the resin cured, I removed the tape, and when uh, a utility knife, I went ahead and shaved off the extra resin, leaving a, nush, a nice flush surface that is left on the fender. Here goes the tank's right hand side fender detailing. The right hand gets a little bit less detailing than the other side, but over here is going to go the tank's wire snipper. And there's a, a small little wrench handle as well as a small little toe S that goes into these two clamps over here. Like I mentioned on the other side, the kid version of the wire snips will not be used. Instead, a new version will be used in its place, and because of which, a new mount had to have been added. On the tank's small box here, the kit version was used, however, it had to be modified. The kit is absent of any type of mounting details that would keep the box mounted to this little case over here. On the real Panzer II, it looks like there was a buckle and strap system. I used one of my resin non-functional latches on the face, a small brass strip for the actual buckle, and on the back, I recycled a piece from a Sherman tank. Another mod that was made to the tank's rear storage bin was the addition of the bottom plate floor. Prior to this, the stock storage bin is hollow and is just a ho hollow cavity and that there's no floor to it. So when you put it onto the vehicle, and if you look down, you'll see nothing but empty space. For the floor plate, I just fabricated out of simple sheet styrene, and if you notice, I brushed on the tank's base coat. This is so that there will always be base coat on it and you won't see any plastic or any of the raw material showing and the part that is exposed will get hit with the airbrush and it'll give it a double coat. For the tank's antenna, the kit supplies you with the early war style leaf spring antenna base, which is appropriate for this period of vehicle. The leaf spring antenna base, the way it worked was the antenna itself was held in place with a system of four leaf springs, two on one side and two on the other side. And the way the leaf springs worked is that they retained the antenna in its place. However, they also allowed the antenna to bend and sway with the movement of the vehicle. Now, probably towards 1942 or so, these were replaced with that of the 
other type of antenna base which is common on the other German vehicles. That consisted of a small little rubber antenna base of which the antenna was removable and the, the rubber antenna base would allow the antenna to, to give and sway with the tank's movement a lot like the leaf spring version did however it was molded in rubber. One unique feature about the early war leaf springs is that they had the ability to retract and the antenna wire will retract into this wooden channel that we have here running along the fender of the, of the vehicle. This was also present on the Panzer III's as well as the Panzer IV's. Now the kit does supply you with the antenna base. The antenna base itself, the details on it are basic but they're adequate in that it will get the job done. Now the kit just designed, the way the kit is designed is that the base itself is comprised of two molded pieces that you glue together. Because of which you will have a seam running along the base which would have to be deleted via putty work. Now molded into the base itself is a small fastener. Because of the way you have that big seam running through it, rather than working with the molded in fastener trying to make sure it doesn't have a seam, it's best to just delete the molded in fastener and replace it with an actual brass one, which is what I have done here. Also, as of note, what was another mod that was done to the uh, to the antenna base was the fact that the kit is designed for the base to be just glued into the vehicle and either in your choice in the up or retracted state. I modified the antenna base with a bolt on the inside that allows the base to retract and go up again. This small little feature adds a little bit of dynamic to the model in that now I can display the antenna in both the retracted and deployed state as well as also when the model's in storage I don't have to worry about the tarp you know the antenna poking through the tarp or possibly snagging something I'm just going to retract it in the down state and I'll be ready for storage. As for the tank's antenna channel itself we notice here that I completely scratch built a new version out of wood. The kit does supply you with the antenna channel here in plastic. The channel itself is the proper shape and the proper proportions and is will do the job. However on the real Panzer II, these channels were not made out of metal, but were made out of wood. And to replicate the plastic to make it look like wood is too difficult, and it's easier just to use real wood. As we can notice, the piece here has not been permanently installed into the vehicle. This is because I want to prime the vehicle first, and then add this piece prior to adding on the tank's base coat. This is done because once the tank has its base coat, I'm going to weather the wood to give it more of that distressed wood look. And with the primer on, it's going to be a lot more difficult to go ahead and do that because the primer is a little bit tougher and will require me to damage the wood a little bit more than if I was to just distress it normally. Also, as we can notice, the wooden channel itself is comprised out of several parts and they are all nailed together via very small fasteners. This wood channel itself has also been added to the eastcoastarmory.com product line. 